Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Philip James with the Dr. Thyroid and RFAMD podcast. And today's guest is Dr. Dylan from Johns Hopkins uh, in Washington, D.C. And she's a laryngologist and ENT uh, surgeon. And it's an important topic today. We're talking about the voice and the risk to voice and swallow um, due to thyroidectomy and some innovations that can help those of you listening or watching avoid thyroid surgery. Uh, Dr. Dylan, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, can you share a little bit more about your background and your experience? Yeah, so um, I um, am originally from the West Coast. Um, I did my training um, on the West Coast, and then I did two fellowships at Johns Hopkins, um, one in laryngology and one in endocrine head and neck surgery, which is thyroid and parathyroid surgery. Um, I am down in the national capital region as part of Johns Hopkins Department of Otolaryngology, or ENT, Um, And my clinical practice is really focused on endocrine head and neck patients and patients um, from a laryngology standpoint that may have some post-operative issues with voice and swallow, as well as general voice and swallow um, complaints um, um, from the general population. So um, it's a pretty busy clinical practice, um, but my research interests are in particular related to outcomes um, from a voice and swallow standpoint, um, as well as laryngeal function, which is a little bit broader in our endocrine head and neck um, surgery patients, um, and how we can best improve those outcomes, either um, through intervention um, or therapy, voice therapy. Um, And now that has extended into outcomes when as it relates to radiofrequency ablation. So, um, you know, at some point, um, you know, we are trying to build a study to look at um, voice outcomes and swallow outcomes for our patients that undergo ablation for thyroid nodules. And it, this topic, it's so important. Uh, it's sometimes overlooked. Um, and I think it's so important for patients to be aware um, the risk of having a thyroidectomy. Um, And one of those risks is voice and swallow outcomes. One of the most common complications, at least from surgery, is uh, vocal cord paralysis. So that is something that really drew me to really learn how to take care of patients that either come in with that or to counsel patients on not, how not to, how how not to, to go in that direction, right? Not to not to have that experience and how to treat them if they did. In all the thyroidectomies that are performed in the U.S. each year, how often does this happen where there's a thyroidectomy and there's a voice problem afterwards? Yeah, so I, if we're going to be academic about that, I think most patients um, will not have a problem subjectively, but there is a relative strong cohort that will complain of some sort of voice change. Um, Whether that be related to a vocal cord paralysis is a little bit difficult to know because unfortunately we don't have a standardized way across the country um, or even globally to determine that um, systematically for all patients. But I would say that the there's probably on average anywhere up to 30 to 50% of patients that have been studied um, in larger um, papers that complain of voice issues after thyroidectomy. Um, The number that actually have a vocal cord paralysis isn't uh, negligent, but it's somewhere maybe in the range from a temporary basis up to, you know, 15% and maybe even higher, depending on what we read. Um, Permanent paralysis is a lot less, but, you know, again, one to 2% isn't, isn't a small number when you're that patient. So it is something that is still um, an ongoing um, point of research, but um, the numbers are relatively um, high enough to, for us to be uh, cognizant and aware as um, surgeons 
to not want that and not have that for our patients. Is it okay to group voice and swallow outcomes or can they be separated? That's a good question. I think a lot of us look um, at the literature and we see a lot of what has been described as voice complaints or voice outcomes for patients. And I think sometimes the swallow component is neglected. Um, but I think if we're going to separate the two and what the best studies show is that actually dysphagia or swallowing complaints is a lot higher for patients. Um, again, these aren't, these aren't large studies, but the largest we have show that patients can have, you know, up to 60% of voice complaints in a temporary period, which is anywhere between post-op and three months. Um, again, usually getting better over time, but within those first three months, that's a pretty high number. So I would separate the two, but it's also um, with the intention that if we're going to be looking at those outcomes, we really need to ask the right questions when we're seeing patients um, and, and not forget about, you know, the swallow if we're asking about the voice and vice versa. The obvious one would be like the severed laryngeal nerve, but are there other problems that occur sometimes uh, post or during thyroidectomy? Yep, that's that's exactly it. I think we always look at the concern about if that nerve has been affected, mainly if it's been cut or if it's been you know injured intraoperatively. And for most surgeons, you know we're pretty knowledgeable if. We see the nerve, then we're able to determine if there is a visual injury to it or if it unfortunately was cut. Um, but despite that, there's a lot to be said that even in a perfect nerve dissection, postoperatively patients can still have complaints. Um, and the best that we can attribute those complaints to are muscular um, issues intra, you know, intraoperatively if we've um, been too close to some of the laryngeal muscles um, extrinsically near the thyroid. Um, there's a small branch called the superior laryngeal nerve, which controls a lot of pitch and projection for patients that also lies um, very close to the thyroid that is much smaller to identify and it isn't always visualized, but you know, there can be concerns that there was injury to that nerve. Um, you know, healing from surgery, you know, we have a scar for most um, thyroidectomies in the neck that include a lot of muscles that have been opened and closed. So scarring, healing, that can lead to a lot of functional voice and swallow issues. So it's, it's actually a pretty broad range of what we call laryngeal dysfunction. And I think that that sort of ambiguous um, uh, you know, cohort of patients that don't have a laryngeal nerve or recurrent laryngeal nerve um, injury, we still have to figure out what's going on with them because ultimately their outcomes aren't the best, even, even months and years after surgery. So we still need to make sure that they do well as well. For the ones that have the severed laryngeal nerve, I think the the problem is quite clear. Um, what are some of the issues that might occur that aren't, uh, say, severed uh, laryngeal nerve, but are still issues? So I think patients that have um, that don't have the severed recurrent laryngeal nerve still experience or can experience voice and swallow complaints. Um, and I think, again, the voice assessment for these patients is very important rather than asking, is your voice changed? It's more of how has the voice changed and the qualities of the voice that have been affected. Um, it can range. And so it's really good to, to investigate what specific qualities of the voice have changed for that patient, because it could be one or two qualities. It could be a whole bunch of qualities. Um, so, for example, vocal fatigue. Um, being able to get loud, pitch, uh, range, um, intonation, um, pain, discomfort um, with voicing. Those are all very important. Um, the same goes for swallow. Um, I think we need to ask patients, is it a matter of 
being able to swallow and things going down the right way? Or is it pain or discomfort? Is it a sense of something stuck in the throat? Um, other issues that patients can have that aren't necessarily voice or swallow may be a cough, a tickle in the throat that's unexplained, or um, you know, a, a whole series of events that can be related to certain triggers that result in coughing, throat pain. And so it, it can be an assortment of things that are beyond just voice and swallow. So these are all things we need to, to be aware of. So when measuring uh, voice and swallow uh, problems after surgery, how is measurement done? That's a very good question. So we have measurements available, albeit I would say that they aren't necessarily the best or most comprehensive measurements and they're not necessarily standardized, but we do have some very good ones that we can use. Um, and I would um, say that if we use them as systematically as possible, then it's probably for the best for our patients to have that knowledge up front. So the most common thing that patients um, undergo when they have a voice or swallow complaint or both is a direct visualization of the larynx. So typically that's done by an ENT or a laryngologist, even a speech language pathologist, but that includes a endoscopy either done through the nose or mouth. Um, and it allows a visual of the larynx and the function of the larynx. Um, if we want to take it one step further, then we can actually um, investigate with what's called a video stroboscopy, which allows us to look at some more nuanced functional issues with the larynx when we're speaking. And that's typically done by a laryngologist because of training and or a speech language pathologist or both in a team fashion. Um, other things when it comes to voice, um, if if there's not something detectable on the direct visualization are what's called acoustic measures. So these are measures where we actually are able to measure, quantify frequency of the pitch of a voice, um, what's called phonation time, the ability to hold uh, phonatory or sustained phonatory stamina for a period of time. And we have normal ranges for all of these. So usually a speech language pathologist can measure these. And so that's a good way to determine dysfunction and what, how to help that dysfunction. Um, and then from a swallow standpoint, you know, we have lots of modalities. We can do a video swallow study, which is an x-ray to look at how, um, you know, physically food bolus is traveling down the back of the throat. If there's any deficiency in that. Um, we can also look at that in the office with a, another endoscopy. We can do a um, what's called a fees or a fluoroscopic evaluation um, um, in the office. Um, and so on top of all of these diagnostics, we ultimately also want to have a team approach with the speech pathologist and a laryngologist, whereby we can do some therapy, either rehabilitative therapy in the form of voice and swallow. Um, and that can be a series of weeks to months with follow-up and then further intervention if needed. So again, there's a huge continuity of care for these patients that does last a while and it's a commitment, but I think that's why it's important to understand the outcome early on, because also we've realized that the earlier we can rehabilitate, the faster we can um, get these patients to at least subjectively um, improve. Um, the, the things that we don't know yet are how to objectively um, improve all of those diagnostics from a pre and post therapy standpoint. I think that's where we need to build some new treatment options for patients, but that's the best we have now. And we have seen that at least subjectively and from patient satisfaction standpoint, getting those underway early on and getting therapy started really helps these patients. Are there some cases where a patient will go somewhere and have a thyroidectomy, feel like after the procedure that there's something wrong with their voice or swallowing, they go back to where they had the surgery, they're told, they're not validated, they're just told, no, you're okay, but they end up in your office? Yes, that is... Um, 
I think definitely very common and unfortunately on, you know, the behest of the patient finding me (laughs) or my team on their own. Um, I don't think it's um, necessarily always a direct referral, um, which is unfortunate because I think, you know, the, the quality of, um, you know, the patient bringing in a complaint postoperatively and what's done to assess that um, can vary between, oh, just give it some time. So there's no, you know, direct intervention at that time. Let's just wait and see to, um, you know, I, I want someone to take a look and someone takes a look and there's maybe nothing that is visualized, but the complaint is still there. And so the patient isn't offered sort of a further evaluation with the specialist. And so it's sort of either left to the you know, devices of the patient to either live the way they are or to find someone else on their own. And I feel like that is something we, at least I try to change within the community I'm in. So patients, you know, I'm very willing to see patients that have complaints that may not be easily um, explainable per se, or everything looks great. And they are still having issues because I think that does take a little bit more of that multidisciplinary approach. I mean, there are times where I don't know what's going on, but maybe the speech therapist knows functionally that this can be something treatable. So again, we can't rule out that there may just be a functional issue that can be worked upon. And so um, patients do seek our help. And again, I think it requires continuity and follow up and um, at least potentially the start of some therapy, um, you know, with a team approach to kind of direct if something's improving or not for a patient. Um, I don't know if it's possible to bucket uh, on two sides. Um, Problems that are treatable and repairable uh, and problems that are not in regard to this issue. Um, Is it possible to break them down as such? And if so, what what does that look like? Yeah, so I think the most important thing for me in terms of what is treatable and what may be more um, involved, I wouldn't say untreatable, but more involved in, in terms of treatment planning is the ability to do a really good exam for patients with laryngeal complaints. And that's sort of where do we start to get the best information to make want a diagnosis, but also a treatment plan that um, may include plan A, plan B, plan C, or just plan A, because it may not, we may be sort of out of other options at the, at the, you know, at the starting point. So what I mean by that is I like to do a really good joint appointment with my speech therapist that includes a video stroboscopy, which is what I mentioned before, a more nuanced exam of the larynx rather than just a direct look to make sure everything just generally looks okay. And by doing that in sort of a team approach, one, it allows, you know, two sets of eyes and two sets of ears um, to the patient complaint. Um, a little bit of in-depth knowledge to some functional issues that may, I might not have, my speech therapists have that may, they may be able to cue in on that we could talk about if it's not directly an anatomic problem. And then the exam itself, um, you know, there's plenty of times where maybe a vocal cord paralysis or a vocal cord asymmetry was missed on initial scope by another provider. And we're able to sort of, with a little bit of time with the patient, see that um, during the exam. Um, And sometimes there are other things that we can pick up, like the patients, um, you know, if the patient doesn't have a voice complaint, they have coughing, are they coughing in the clinic? What do they cough to? What are their triggers? Can we induce it? Can we see what happens in the larynx if they're coughing? So there are certain things that a joint appointment with myself as a laryngologist and a voice therapist, again, I think based on training um, and maybe an ear, that's just a little bit more clued in helps us sort of devise a plan. So those patients, again, I think 
we've sort of, by doing that, we've sort of opened up the door to this is now maybe if it wasn't treatable, this is treatable, but let's investigate this with a little bit different perspective. So it's not a necessarily like a vocal core paralysis. If I see that my speech therapist and I see that it's okay, let's consider whether or not therapy and an injection, which is what we typically do to help medialize the vocal cord is acceptable. Which order do we want to do it in? That's sort of a straightforward approach. But what about the patient with, you know, thyroidectomy, cough, throat pain, and voice change? Let's sort of investigate if they're all connected. Are they, how can we address one and then get back to the others? Let's maybe start some therapy and see if there's some tension in there that we can unload. There's sort of this larger picture that we kind of, you know, this narrative that we kind of piece together with the patient for a treatment plan. So again, I don't think it's a matter of treatable versus untreatable. Obviously the more straightforward patients we can get and be better faster. Um, but the ones that are a little bit more nuanced, it's just more involved. But I think it takes that team approach and that, that sort of really good exam up front to like break that down with the patient. And I think that also leads to patient satisfaction and better outcome because they they feel that there's all of this sort of done together rather than, oh, let's take a look. It looks fine. Let's, you know, you're okay. Or that's not something we can take care of. Are you doing um, voice and swallow tests before the surgery? Yes. Yes. Um, and I think that's another um, good point. Um, that's not standard of care everywhere. Um, guidelines, um, you know, I think fluctuate on whether or not we should be doing a direct visualizations or laryngeal exams prior to um, any endocrine head and neck surgery. Um, however, there are a lot of proponents for it, including a lot of societies um, globally and in the United States, including, you know, the American Thyroid Association, American Head and Neck um, Society. Um, I do do a video stroboscopy on all of my pre-op patients. Um, I don't have a speech therapist all the time, but I do do a video stroboscopy on everyone pre um, and then post-operatively if there are significant complaints. Um, and for me, significant can be, um, you know, my, my voice is slightly different, but not so bad. If that lasts for me between, you know, if it's up to two months post-op, they're going to get another video stroboscopy. Um, but I like to know that at my post-op appointment, which is usually within two weeks, and we kind of continue to follow. If nothing improves, um, then we do want to scope and get them into therapy right away. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of my protocol from, from a pre- and post-op standpoint. I guess there, from a patient's uh, point of view, there's a certain level of, of peace of mind. The, a surgeon is putting the kind of, of attention that you're putting into uh, voice and swallow. Um, and how is that conversation between you and the patient um, before doing a thyroidectomy compared to, say, uh, when that patient goes to a, a surgeon who doesn't have the level of dedication to voice and swallow like you? I think, I mean, I think regardless of um, the knowledge maybe of the laryngology component in, in head and neck or endocrine head and neck patients, I think the most important thing is to make sure the patient is informed that there is a risk to one, the recurrent laryngeal nerve. There is a risk potentially to this superior laryngeal nerve, which is the second branch in surgery. And these are the potential complications if that nerve is injured. And then to address that, even if it's a perfect surgery, if everything goes great, which is what we hope, that you still may have some functional um, voice and swallow issues post-op that um, are maybe more prevalent and something that if it does happen, either I, you know, the surgeon can help you with post-op or at least refer you if that is the case to someone that can address it. I think by saying that up front in the counseling portion um, of the of the conversation with the patient prior to surgery, the patient is aware. They are, you know, they're aware that you know the, that there are these nuances that can happen with the voice and they're not going to be surprised um, that, oh, well, my my nerve was fine, but why my voice? Why does my voice sound this way? Um, so I think just by elaborating on that, um, 
I think that's the best advice I can give because it doesn't mean that you have to be able to handle whatever voice complaint or, you know, non-voice complaint, but laryngeal complaint they have post-op, but the fact that you mentioned it um, and that they have somewhere to go, um, it really goes a long way for patients to feel like that was, you know, that was one paid attention to, but two, that it, it was an important issue that we addressed up front so that they have more knowledge about it. I uh, wouldn't addressing up front and um, sometimes the patient is told by a doctor that thyroidectomy is very low risk and uh, it's an easy, they might tell them it's an easy surgery, but um, with what you're describing and when you kind of consult the patient before the surgery, have you ever had a patient say, you know, I really value my voice. I'm going to skip the thyroidectomy. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that is, um, I mean, it, depending on the patient and the reason for surgery, right? Because there are some true indications to doing thyroidectomy um, that we, you know, can't really um, question or argue with at this point in time, but based on the disease pathology, um, I think having a, a question back as to why does it scare you to undergo this surgery? What about your voice and swallow is so important. I think that's a good conversation to have with the patient. I do have a lot of professional voice users, as I know many surgeons do that come through requiring thyroid surgery. Um, and you know, their voice is their, either their instrument um, it's their profession, it's their, you know, their face to the world. And so that is something that they're not willing to part with or have a change in. And so if that's the case, and we still need to go forward with surgery, I usually end up um, having them see my speech pathologist um, early on prior to surgery, which is something actually I was trained in, in my fellowship for endocrine head and neck surgery. I was trained to have the patient see the speech pathologist, which I think goes a long way because there's sort of this early investment on the voice. And then, you know, with, with outcomes, we have a goal. If, if it's not met, let's say the voice does change, we have a way to rehabilitate and the patient's part of that process. Um, so I think, you know, that, that, that goes a long way. Um, I've also, you know, if we're talking about radiofrequency ablation, you know, I've had a lot of patients with benign disease who say, you know, I, my voice is really important to me. I don't want to have to go through surgery. Is RFA an option? And I think that's a nice um, transition to talk about that as a treatment if they're a candidate for it. We do talk about the risks to the nerve and it is a lot less than surgery, but what can they expect um, if they go through this process. So that, that is something that a lot of patients, you know, do ask about, can I do the RFA instead of surgery to save my voice? So that is the good news um, that, that there are other treatment options that could uh, be a remedy to whatever the problem is uh, that don't involve surgery. So can you tell us more about RFA? Yeah, so radiofrequency ablation is one type of minimally invasive technology that we have um, fortunately adopted into, um, you know, thyroidology. Um, and um, it can be done by, um, you know, multiple uh, disciplines. So interventional radiology, surgeons, endocrinologists, but the training um, is such that our goal is to uh, thermally ablate or cause cell necrosis or cell death in the nodule itself, such that we have a volume reduction in the nodule. And so depending upon the disease pathology, our goal is to allow for, um, you know, either less compressive symptoms or cosmetic concerns for benign disease um, and if we're talking about malignancy for patients that have persistent or recurrent, um, either, you know, primary cancers back in the thyroid bed, um, if they've had previous surgeries or lymph node disease, our goal is to provide treatment such that, um, you know, their disease is, um, kept at bay as much as possible without causing more morbidity with more surgery. Um, so in that sense, RFA is a 
way to preserve the thyroid or other structures um, in the neck if a patient has had previous surgery and provide hopefully less comorbidity or rather. Um, when talking about thyroid ablation of, uh, or thyroid nodules, um, it, it doesn't seem like we're hearing much about the risk to voice or swallowing due to ablation. What are some of the risks related to voice and swallow due to ablation? Yeah, I think um, because the technology is still building, I mean, we can look at our counterparts uh, in Asia who have looked at this and the, the rates of, uh, for example, vocal cord uh, paralysis are very low, um, you know, less than 1% in some studies. Um, so, but, you know, in terms of the technology, at least in the United States, we're still building upon our our numbers and our, our, our results. But again, I think, Generally speaking, um, the risks to the voice and to voice and swallow specifically is really due in part to that recurrent laryngeal nerve, um, which is still a direct um, target to the approach with the RFA um, treatment. And what I mean by that is, depending on where the nodule is, the size of the nodule, the amount of energy we use, um, um, how we approach the nodule. Um, we can potentially get into this uh, area that's sort of near the trachea and the esophagus, which is where the nerve sits um, on either side of the neck. And so if we get into that zone, we can potentially cause injury, thermal injury to the nerve, which results in a vocal cord uh, weakness. Um, and so, you know, we have to be very mindful of that. I think um, one thing that a lot of the advocates for RFA um, and myself included um, um, understand about RFA over surgery is that a lot of our patients that go through this process are awake. So we do this in an office or an endoscopic suite um, whereby we have the advantage of having them speak with us during the procedure. And so one of, one of the abilities to um, for, for us audibly is to detect any voice change while we're doing the procedure, which isn't something we're able to do intraoperatively. Um, and by doing that, by knowing that we can hear a change in voice or the patient notices a change in voice, we have the ability to potentially stop and maybe even reverse um, the voice change. So we're, we, we can cause potential or nearing potential injury and reverse it such that there is a recovery. Um, and so we're not, we're not sort of left with um, permanent vocal, vocal um, or swallow um, um, complications that we might see in surgery. Um, what kind of attention should be given to voice and swallow related to ablation in, in regard to research? Yeah, I think um, this is a, this is an area that is still being looked upon, like I said, based on numbers and data. I think for one, we all agree um, and guidelines would recommend that we do a laryngeal exam um, for patients pre-RFA and post-RFA to verify that we um, have intact um, you know, laryngeal function prior to starting a procedure and we know what the laryngeal function is after, at least anatomically. Um, I think we can include upon that in, in a research standpoint, a voice assessment, something that laryngologists do all the time, but something we can, you know, very, again, very specifically and nuanced ask about what are the qualities of the voice um, that, you know, are, you have or are deficient in pre and post, um, post-operatively. And that can be followed with you know, validated patient reported outcomes that we have questionnaires for from a voice and swallow standpoint. Um, I think um, the other part of this is, um, you know, looking at the size, location, and number of nodules um, in relationship to the territory that the nerve sits in, and actually um, having some sort of standardized protocol to um, document that, as well as document the patient's um, um, you know, voice during the procedure um, and maybe even getting them to fill out a questionnaire about their voice and swallow, um, you know, pre and post. I think there's a bunch of different things we can add and sort of describe. Um, ultimately, I think if we show in our post-procedural post, -op or post -procedural laryngeal exam that there's 
no evidence of at least a true weakness or, or paralysis, then that would show that the risk is very, very low in RFA over surgery. Um, but that would be a nice way to kind of sum that up if we had enough, enough patients in a study. Uh, if it's a patient listening to this uh, episode and they're scheduled for a surgery, um, should the patient take for granted that every operating room is the same in regard to technology? Because there's so much great technology today compared to even five or 10 years ago in regard to even preserving the laryngeal nerve. Mm -hmm. um, should every patient assume all operating rooms are equal in regard to technology? And if not, um, what kind of technology today is available to help make sure that the outcome of surgery is least harmful? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, no, you can't assume that every operating room has the same technology. Um, and I think um, it's a good thing to ask generally when you, you know, patients see a surgeon um, for endocrine head and neck surgery, thyroid, parathyroid surgery, that they ask, you know, not, you know, the number of cases that the surgeon may do, the, the typical, um, you know, team in the hospital is this, you know, something that, you know, they, there's a team approach to and in, in, in terms of not just the surgeon, but, you know, the, the pre and post operative management of the patient um, and intraoperative management, uh, because that can all be very variable. Um, and so it's a good question to ask up front in terms of uh, a patient wanting to know what sorts of amenities or technologies a surgeon may use or have with his team um, during the surgery. But the, the technology that is currently out there to help with um, nerve uh, protection or preservation in the operating room is what's known as a uh, nerve monitoring or intraoperative nerve monitoring. And that's typically done in, um, in with anesthesia. And so we use a specific endotracheal tube um, and there's, you know, different varieties of them, but the technology is all very equal whereby we intubate with a very specific tube with electrodes on it that allows um, the surgeon in, in the OR to either um, um, intermittently stimulate the nerve or continuously monitor the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Um, and while that technology is not foolproof, meaning that you know if, if there is a stimulation, it doesn't necessarily mean that the nerve is, in, is gonna be fully intact postoperatively, there is a standard protocol in which we can use that technology if the surgeon is well-versed in that protocol. And so we can use it to either hopefully prevent um, and potentially predict or help stage thyroid surgery um, or rather predict or prevent nerve injury and help stage thyroid surgery if we think that um, the nerve may be injured um, during, during the surgery. And so it's a very, um, I think it's a for those of us, and I'll include myself in that, that are, you know, still the young ones coming out of fellowship <laughs> um, and, and learning, this is all of us learn using this technology. So I think it's becoming more um, prevalent out there in terms of most of us use it. But, you know, it's still something patients may want to ask about, especially when it comes to um, the, surgeon, the surgeon having the best technology with them to keep that nerve um, safe and to prevent, um, you know, voice problems and swallow problems post-op. Well, it's exciting, actually, uh, Dr. Dillon, the, you referenced to the new generation that you're part of uh, in treatment professionals. For those uh, who need thyroidectomy or some sort of uh, treatment for a thyroid nodule, because it feels like the new generation is paying attention to um, issues related to uh, thyroid, thyroid surgery, um, thyroid nodules, like what you're doing with a lot of attention to uh, quality of life after surgery or voice outcomes. Um, so I think it's encouraging for patients now with this new generation of professionals like yourself. Um, question if the laryngeal nerve is severed and with 
today's technology, which seems to be taking leaps uh, longer than ever, uh, faster than ever, um, what can be done if a laryngeal nerve is severed? So if a laryngeal nerve is severed, I think ultimately, especially with regards to thyroid surgery, um, you know, there are reasons to sacrifice the nerve. Um, if it is cancer or if the nerve is involved, um, or if, you know, more than the thyroid is involved, unfortunately for some invasive types of thyroid cancer, yes, we have to sacrifice the nerve because oncologically we wouldn't be doing the right surgery if we were leaving tumor behind. Um, so again, um, it's important for, for patients, um, specifically with, um, cancer diagnoses, in my opinion, to undergo a laryngeal exam, because sometimes you never know a vocal cord could already be out because the nerve is involved. Um, and that would be, well, you know, that would be good to know prior to going to sleep and having surgery, but intraoperatively it can be involved and it needs to be taken because you don't want to leave that behind and have recurrent cancer. Um, if it's severed, um, and it's intact and we're not dealing with cancer, um, then there are ways intraoperatively that we can um, basically reanastomose or put back together the severed nerve with a different um, nerve ending from another nerve in the neck, um, and that's called reinnervation. That does not necessarily, and I'll put that out there, does not necessarily result in full motion or mobility of the vocal cord um, again um, in, in the patient's future, but it can improve voice outcomes and tone of an otherwise paralyzed muscle um, if we did that over not doing that. And that's what research has shown with re -innervation. So some surgeons can do that intraoperatively if they've severed the nerve, hoping for the best outcome for the patient. Um, post postoperatively, um, and that process of reinnervation and better tone to the muscle that can take almost up to a year sometimes to to kind of get that to happen, but it it can be done um, if the nerve is severed and um, reinnervation isn't completed. Then what we're left with is a vocal cord paralysis, um, and that's you know a permanent um, prognosis, unfortunately. Um, because we know that that muscle isn't going to be re uh, when we, when the patient's woken up. So at that point, uh, we want to try our best to rehabilitate the deficiencies that the patient's going to face because of that. So voice will be very weak, very breathy, um, swallow will also be difficult. So patients are a little bit higher risk of aspiration. Um, and so we want to do what's called static interventions um, from a laryngology standpoint. So we can do what's called medialization procedures. So that can be anything between an injection to the paralyzed vocal cord to basically bulk it up and push it closer to the, um, to the midline of the larynx so that there's no gap between the vocal cords to a permanent implant, which um, is called a thyroplasty. So these are all things that we'd want to have a conversation with the patient after their thyroid surgery, parathyroid surgery to have that discussion. Um, I think ultimately it, what's most important is if we know the nerve is severed and we're not going to be able to rehabilitate or re-innervate, I'm sorry, intraoperatively, um, patients should be referred or seen by the specialist that can provide the static intervention ASAP. Um, so as soon as possible, because we really want to rehabilitate voice and swallow before it becomes problematic. Um, hopefully, you know, before a patient is suffering at home, can't go to work, aspirating. So we really want to see them as soon as possible. Is there uh, any technology on the horizon for someone who has a severed laryngeal nerve um, five years ago, 10 years ago? Is there any uh, technology on the horizon that might restore that function one day? Unfortunately, no, <laughs> not, not at this point in time. Um, that's the, the kind of the, the magic wand, the crystal ball that we all wish, um, you know, we could, could read, redo. But um, I think, you know, um, 
the best that we have is, um, you know, the medialization procedures for patients um, and voice therapy. Um, Dr. Dillon, as we come close to the end here, um, for those listening, any final thoughts you would like to share with a patient listening to this interview? Yeah, I think as a patient, I would advocate for you to do your research and know um, what outcomes are important to you, but also the potential risks of any thyroid parathyroid surgery, as well as what you can find online about RFA in the most um, well-informed sites and bring that information to your um, surgeon if you're going for surgery um, and, and discuss what's important in terms of outcomes. I think it's also important that if, you know, you're not able to get your answers with that provider, it may be that you just need to have another name or information for another person that can provide you more information with regards to the, those outcomes. So for example, if you see someone that does great head and neck endocrine surgery, can do your RFA, but may not be so well versed in voice outcomes, swallow outcomes, what, you know, am I going to have any issues with my throat, um, you know, post-op or post-op or post-RFA, ask that person if they can refer you to a laryngologist or a specialist that may be able to provide you just a little bit more knowledge prior to proceeding with your treatment or an exam. And I think by, by being that person on the other end, I appreciate that uh, because it allows me to have patients um, reach out to me if they need me. And, and, you know, I may not be there, their thyroid surgeon or their RFA provider, but at least there's a continuity there. And it, hopefully they walk away from my appointment with some more knowledge on what they want to do and how they want to proceed. So I think being the patient and having that, um, you know, in your Rolodex or in your, in your, you know, phone as a, as a number or contact for another specialist, it, it provides maybe a little bit more safety or a little bit more um, peace of mind that um, you know where to go in case something um, goes wrong. But it's good to ask and it's good to be an advocate for those outcomes for yourself prior to proceeding. And, and I think for patients listening, when they're faced with the possibility of a surgery, um, when I interviewed Dr. Leo Angel in Brazil, a surgeon who offers ablation, and we discussed or he discussed how important it is when selecting a surgeon that the patient knows that the surgeon has a full toolbox of options, such as ablation. Uh, but I think it goes further in that toolbox uh, is a patient is talking to surgeons. And I think there's a certain level of comfort if the surgeon walks into the consultation and brings up issues such as voice versus a surgeon who does not bring up that issue, but also offers uh, surgery alternatives. Uh, can you just touch a little bit on that toolbox? Um, there should be a level of confidence the patient feels when their provider is talking about these issues that could go with surgery. Yeah. Um, so I think, I mean, Hopefully this, this answers the question, um, but I think, you know, when I walk into the room with a patient for thyroid surgery, obviously voice and swallow, um, I, I, we talk about it pretty frankly, and I bring up risks and potential, you know, the potential of, of functional issues and how, you know, that can be, that can affect um, the patient, even if they're not even thinking about it potentially. Um, at that time, because it really th focused on the thyroid or whatever, and we we have to focus on all outcomes. But I I do my best to suggest that if there is a risk and we have to address that risk, um, this is what I can do um, as as your you know post stop in your post stop visit. If you came to me with this complaint, this is what I can do to facilitate um, improvement. If you you know do have those. Um, concerns or have those dysfunctions. So, you know, I provide injection 
laryngoplasty or medialization in the office. Um, you know, I do implants in the operating room. God forbid there's a permanent vocal cord uh, paralysis. Um, you know, we do voice therapy all the time in the office. So getting them plugged into the therapist. Um, you know, we, we talk about um, the cough and the tickles and the throat pain. And um, laryngologists have adopted a nerve block to the superior laryngeal nerve to treat a lot of um, pain and cough. Uh, and that's been around for a while, but I, I implement those in my daily practice. So I have had a lot of patients that have had some discomforts postoperatively and usually temporary, but, you know, we can implement those treatments right away to see if they improve. So those are all part of my toolbox um, on top of, I think, maybe the benefit of being a laryngologist and an endocrine head and neck surgeon is I think I hold on to my patients a lot longer than maybe some surgeons just because that continuity stays with me if there is some sort of dysfunction and I like to see it through. Um, so I do have a lot of patients I have seen and, you know, they have been eventually rehabilitated or, or we've gotten to a place where their outcomes are the best we can provide, but it's better than it was. And so, you know, there is a little bit of that um, kind of long-term I think relationship that I hold with some of them because of that toolbox. Mm. Um, Dr. Dillon, as we bring things to a close, any final thoughts you would like to share with those uh, listening today? Um, I just want to thank actually you, Philip, for the opportunity <laughs> to um, to be here on this podcast. Um, I I think that as we continue to explore more minimally invasive approaches to the thyroid and interventions to the thyroid. The reasons why we are exploring um, and why this is becoming so prevalent, um, for example, ablation and other technologies is because outcome in, in, in our patients is so important. And I think that on top of developing and advancing these technologies, we need to focus on these outcomes themselves and what we can do better in terms of knowing more about them. And so, you know, that's, that's kind of my hope and my goal in my own career is to kind of build upon maybe the larynx and see, you know, what are the things that we can improve upon with the technologies and how can we best address and maybe even quantify um, those outcomes for our patients. Well, thank you. And for those listening or watching um, and you want to get in touch, um, all of your contact info will be in the description to this episode. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dillon. Yeah, thank you. That was great. Appreciate that.